all of that. And it's great to be together. Thank you. Uh, I know it's hard. It's a hard, it takes effort to come here uh, 9.30, and uh, especially with the weather and the conditions. But really want to uh, uh, give you a shout out because this conversation is so important. And if you weren't here last week, we started back, but we've started back with a little bit of a different tag. Last week, um, I held up the calculator that uh, I uh, worked on with my father as a little boy. And we talked about how times have changed. And Pastor Guy um, will come back today and your feedback uh, was heard. Thank you so much for being involved in this conversation. And this week, he's going to be uh, uh, taking us a little further down the path of this conversation of what does it look like to be church in this time, in this place. And um, I'd ask that you, uh, if you would, just take a moment, we'll go to the Lord who has called us here and who really is the one leading us. Lord, we commend ourselves to you. We entrust our loved ones and family to you, especially, Lord, those that are out on the road, uh, your family, the church around the world. We pray for Dawn and Steve, um, for Sam in Guatemala. We, we pray for Jenny and Kate, Lord God, in Costa Rica. And we pray for Pastor Guy and for your people here, that we might uh, be led by your spirit in these important conversations. We praise and thank you for this day, and we bring all this to you in Jesus' name, the people of God said. Amen. So last week, um, I brought a calculator. This week, I brought the world. <laughs> One of you uh, was singing as I was walking down the ha hall. He's got the whole world. Well, not exactly. But this reminds me of a conversation that took place in our home uh, about a year ago. And the conversation had to do with our daughter who was preparing to go to Guatemala. And um, she, uh, or excuse me, she was preparing to go to Taiwan. She had been in Guatemala the year before. And I was talking to her about how difficult it is for I to conceive and consider this. And, uh, and I had even lived in Germany. And she said, oh, this is, this is the part you have to hear. Oh, Dad, flying to Guatemala is just like flying to Texas. Now, now, I want you to think about that because I pressed her. I said, are you out of your mind, Molly? Flying to Guatemala is not like flying to Texas. Well, it is for me. And Dad, it's not that big of a deal. And so I've had to kind of think about this, especially since she married the son of a missionary who's heading back to Africa. And this son has hopes of being an international medical missionary. And I've had to think about, you know, what are some things that as a child or a person from my generation that I believe to be true that maybe I've had to rethink? You know? So I want you to go back to your childhood for a moment. Because I, in preparation for today, went back to... Uh, Jeff, who was about seven years old, living in West Dallas, Wisconsin, and there was a very scary place in our house. You know what it was? The basement. I was convinced it was my truth that you should never go to the basement by yourself. Because it may not happen this time, but it is going to happen sometime, you're going to get it. No, no, I mean, this is truth for Jeff. And I'm the oldest in the family, and I have younger siblings, and it is great to be an older brother. Greg, come on, let's go to the basement. And Greg's like, I'm not going to the basement. Forget you. But to have a baby sister who's five years younger is really great. As if she could do anything to keep me from getting it. 
Heidi, come on, let's go to the basement. Okay. Now, let's think about it. I believed that was truth. That was my truth. So what did you believe was true? Everyone here, we've got even, well, Evan, what are you, about like 12 now? No, like seven, eight, nine. There you go. What do you, what is something that you had to, that you believed is true, that you had to think about, wrestle with over the years? For me, driving to, or flying to Guatemala is not like going to Texas, period. But, so, get in your group, spend a couple of minutes, and have at it, talk together, get to know the people God's placed around you. You've got just a couple of minutes to spend talking about something that you believed was true when you were a kid. Maybe it's something you were afraid of, and now you're really not afraid of it anymore. Maybe it's something that you uh, were convinced was true, and now you're not so sure. Have at it. back here. It's, it's so good to be together. So let me throw one last truth that I had as a child that is, you know, uh, just being brought into question. I would have never thought that my Lutheran school could actually have simultaneous class or some sort of linkage with another people in another nation, with another language. And yet, that's happening. Already, our Living Word Lutheran High School has been wrestling with these things, and St. John's, Mrs. Oldenettle, is not in Guatemala on a joy trip with Steve Coppins and with Sam Barbacek, a graduate of our school. Last week, they had a trial Skype of class and it was very successful. Isn't it amazing to think that our children at St. John's will have children someday and they won't even think anything odd about having education with classmates halfway around the world. Wow. Times are changing. And we are going to have a chance to talk about how do you do ministry in this world. It's just so good to see you all back here. Oh, all week I was just so excited to get right back here. I didn't want to stop. I'm sure you were ready, but I just wanted to keep going. I have just so many things that we've been talking about here at St. John's Pastors and, and uh, so many things to, to, to share. And so um, I just want to make sure that, that we can get through them, and we'll just see what the Lord provides for us here today as well. But before we move on to uh, the, this lesson's week, I just want to do some clarifying from last week. I thought overall I got a lot of good feedback, and a lot of things seem to connect with people, and so I thank you and appreciate all that feedback. It definitely helps. But there are two things for sure that um, we just wanted to make sure are completely clarified. One was a question by Tom uh, Seleska, and it was a good question. Um, and, I, and I just had to give it some t thought this week to make sure that we're all on the same page. But he asked the question, what is culture? So I just went right to Merriam-Webster Dictionary. I pulled out what we would define culture as, and here's what we come up with. It's very, very easy to understand. The customary beliefs, social forms, and material traits of a racial, religious, or social group, also the characteristic features of everyday existence as diversions of way of life shared by people in a place or type. See? Okay, good. <laughs> no, and you know, really what, what I tried to define quickly, but I just didn't, I didn't want to spend too much time there last week, but really, it is the way it is in the place which you live, is the way I would define it. The, what are the things that are, are shared commonly? And uh, we have kind of an interesting culture in that universalism and some of the things we're going to talk about later, tolerance, things existing, co coexisting side by side are a part of it. So, it's not necessarily that everything is uh, common, but there is a common belief that all things don't have to be common. So, we'll, we'll, whatever. But I thought this was another one. When we talk about, when we're, we're kind of comparing and talking about the uh, post-Christian culture we live in now, when I met, mentioned that, I thought this word was also kind of helpful. 
and I might use them sort of interchangeably. And it's society, I thought this was a little more easy to understand. A community, nation, or broad grouping of people having common traditions, institutions, and collective activities and interests. And so I would say that that's, that's probably a pretty good definition of what we're talking about here when we talk about culture, when we talk about society, or where we live here. Um, so just wanted to clarify there. And then this I wanted to clarify on. Um, I got a little bit, although we worked through a lot of this um, last week, and most of you said that that was your experience, I did want to make sure that we come back to this. Um, in Genesis chapters 1 and 2, God creates family. This is before the fall into sin. And he creates it with one man. The two shall become one flesh. What God has put it together, let no one pull it asunder. And what purpose did they exist for? Take care of God's creation and procreate. Boom, family. Um, so, when God says, as we talked about last week, one man, one wife, anything that's not that then in this broken world could be defined as sin, for sure, which was my point. We talked about how a culture a answers questions. But I want to make sure you get this part, too. Um, Ephesians 5, 22 through 33 says, Husbands love your wife, Christ loves the church. Wives, submit to your husbands as to the Lord. This talks about the relationship between husband and wife. And anyone who's ever been in the relationship of marriage knows that this is not how it works. And so, in every sense, marriage as an institution lives within sin. Right? So it's not that just because you are here that you're not sinful. It's just in this way you still happen to follow God's design. But in this way, anyone knows um, that husbands are idiots. <laughs> and say stupid things. Raise your hand if it's ever happened to you. Right? And wives may, or at one time or another, second guess their husbands. <laughs> Anyone? <laughs> All right. You guys got there yet? <laughs> no. <laughs> it's coming. <laughs> the point is the entire thing, the whole of creation, every institution, every family, every relationship we experience is what? Cursed. And so yes, sin reigns. It's no surprise that it's this way. And we as Christians are not immune to it. We just recognize it as so. So just to clarify, God defines family. For us, what God says is truth. Okay? All right. So that makes me feel better as if we kind of, kind of caught up to those two things and we can move on. I sent you home last week with an article. Who had a chance to read the article? The article was titled, Can Faith Survive in a Post-Christian Culture? And when I, when I looked at this later in the week and after talking to some of you, I was like, that's kind of doomsday-ish. Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> Can faith survive? Well, I mean, of course the answer is yes, because what? Yeah, we belong to who? And he's the hope. And in fact, throughout the history of the world, and I just want to make sure you heard this, what we're going to talk about today is I'm very hopeful. The Christian church has dwelt in its existence, most of its existence in the world has dwelt in a post, in an anti-Christian culture. Right? We're just in a post-Christian culture. So, I mean, the church, even today in parts of the world, is, is persecuted and cast aside and looked down. And, and, you know, this is just the history of the world. So, for us, yeah, not only can it survive, but it can thrive. We have examples of this all over the place. And, you know, for us, though, we have to just, what we're going to pause here is just recognize where we are in our culture, our society. Recognize where we are and recognize that it's not the way it used to be. And this is where the example I tried to share last week of reorienting. You're lost in the woods. All of a sudden you recognize that you're lost and you have to kind of get your bearings get back on track and that's really the point of last week is that that's this is just where we are so um, I have lots of people sharing articles with me on email and all kinds of things things that they were seeing in the culture all around them so it must have for a lot of you it must have been something that made you think as you left here and that's just praise the Lord for that but um, I want to ask the question what else you know, if, if, if culture and the church were married and kind of walking down the road together, if they were walking down together arm in arm, what, what happened over those years? What was, has been tossed out in this relationship? And what are the things that have just kind of been tossed aside, even in the church, the influence into the church? And I came up with these things I want to share with you. 
I think absolute truth has been kind of cast aside, even for a lot of Christians, definitely in our culture. I think God's sovereignty has been tossed aside. You know what that word sovereignty means? Pastor Jeff was talking about it today. He sang a song about it on your kids. He's got the whole world. It's okay, very nice. The law, God's law has been tossed out. You see this all the time. What's being removed from, from courthouses all over the country? Ten Commandments. God's providence, the idea that everything we have comes from Him. The resurrection, right? And you see this, you see this in, uh, in people's view of worship. You see, even within the church, you see this in their view of, of holidays like Christmas and Easter and what they've become about. Um, uh, organized people's view towards organized religion. So I want to pause now. This is the one part where you are going to split into groups. Okay? And so um, if you want to just turn your chair half, because we're going to come back here in a few minutes. But I want to ask you, what else can you think of that as the church and the culture walk side by side the last however many years it's been, um, and now we find ourselves there no longer in, in kind of a relationship that would work, what else has been tossed out? What are some other things you'd come up with? Ready, go. <laughs> Break it up. I always hate to break up good conversation. I'd much rather you all be staring at one another with blank faces before I interrupt it. But as we as we reflect on these things, as we come back to them, I just want to make I just want to remind you of some of the things we talked about last week. I'm not saying we live in an anti-Christian culture. I'm saying we live in a post-Christian culture where these things no longer are kind of the the um, uh, the things that set the pace, I guess, or the things that are just kind of naturally assumed, or at least at the very most, people just know these are kind of foundational truths. These, there was a time, even in my lifetime, where these things were kind of just, you didn't have to talk about them much. They weren't controversial. And, and that, those days are starting to kind of slip away. And so you, you see things that have been tossed out. And with some of these major things, like that, absolute truth and the law and resurrection and God's sovereignty and God's providence, um, these things, with some of these things for sure, we haven't yet begun to experience the full effect of these. For example, in, when each of you put into the offering plate your, your first fruit offering to the Lord, there's also another purpose. There's another thing that happens for you there. You get a little statement at the end of the year, and what are you able to do? Right? Well, those days are probably going to come to an end here pretty soon. That'll catch up, because that's really not something that, uh, that makes all that much sense where we're headed. All right? Or, for example, that we're a nonprofit organization. The church has been facing this some. We are having to kind of make decisions about what we believe. You know, the non-discriminatory, you know, discriminatory statements, what are those things called that we have to say when we hire someone and the like? Well, those days, if we're going to stand for something contrary to the culture, we're probably going to have to give up our tax-exempt status at some point in the years to come. You guys notice this? It's kind of feel that this is coming, right? And all these things are slipping away. For pastors, we get, and church workers, we get a break, something from kind of a remnant of a, a former time where any, anything we spend on our housing is tax deductible. And that's just such a blessing to us. We've been enjoying it for a while, but um, Wisconsin, we can thank Wisconsin, has uh, now had something in court that'll probably go to the Supreme Court within a year or two, that'll probably be gone. All right? Um, it just doesn't make sense to the majority of the people in our culture why that would exist. All right? Does that make sense? So this is a post-Christian culture that we're talking about. And so the things you shared are probably all just very real felt things that we are seeing have just kind of been tossed out. Um, but what I want, what I want to um, kind of make this point is where we're headed in, this, in a lot of circles where we got here is that ultimately when you get rid of all these truths and you get rid of all these things, the danger for the Christian church is this, that Jesus gets tossed out. You see this? Because we live in a culture that God is optional. Is this what Jesus says about himself? That I'm optional? No. And see, this is what we're going to run headlong into. If you haven't started running into it already, which a majority, a lot of us in here have, this is where it's, if you haven't started to feel this, you will start to feel this. And so the point is, 
We can't at mourn those days. The days are gone. And it's not something to be uh, have despair or a lack of hope about. It's just that, the, that those days are gone. We can't be the crying bride. We need to reorient and recognize that we were never meant to be married to the culture ever. We were meant to be married to Christ. That is who we are married to. We are the bride and the groom is Jesus Christ. And so this is where we just kind of put, you know, it was nice to have those days in a lot of ways. They definitely added their own complications. But if Jesus is the groom and we are to follow him, then we just have to remind ourselves of what he says. And anyone that went through the discipleship Bible studies last week, you could have heard this mantra over the last year and a half, over and over and over and over, that Jesus' ministry begins with the words, repent. For the kingdom of heaven is near. And then his next words are to his disciples where he says, and that's a great summary of the life of discipleship. The Lord calls us to repent and follow. It's, a, it's just a, a constant rhythm of the Christian life, a constant repentance of those who live in a cursed world. And so for us then, the question is, how do we do that now? How do we do that today? And this is what I and Pastor Jeff and all of us have been waiting for right here in this presentation, this moment. This is the moment we've been waiting to be able to start talking about this how. How do we do this? We can talk about the culture. We can complain about the culture. We can talk about society and how far it's gone astray and how there's no hope for it. And we can be doomsday-ish and all that stuff, but we need to just set that aside. We are the, Christ, the church of Jesus Christ. We exist in the world, and our hope is... Our hope is... Okay, say it. Jesus. Because our hope is... Jesus. And that's who we cling to when we follow. Jesus. And we look to. Jesus. And who's the groom? Jesus. And that's where we're at. We're reoriented. And so truth then comes from there. And so I'm just ecstatic to finally be at this place. And this is where it could get a little nerdy, no doubt. But we got to we got to put some serious attention to this. And one of the things that I want to teach you is just this. If you haven't come to grips with this, we believe in absolute truth as Christians. We believe in the absolute truth, the way and the life. His name is? Jesus. All right? So that will be an affront to the culture and society around us in every way. Expect it. But individuals who live out our lives, I am convinced that everyone in this culture has truth still. It's just you can't say that they're someone else's truth. So what we have is, how many people are in this country? Like 320 million? We have 321 different books of truths running around. Million. 320 million. <laughs> books of truths. I don't even probably less than that. But the general gist of it is everyone has these. And they look to them, and they dictate, they drive, they, um, they make sense of the world around the person. They, they uh, inform how they're going to think, how they're going to speak, and how they're going to act. And it's, this just happens. It's just everyone has them. And really what it comes down to is most people don't know that they have them or that they've been influenced. So they don't think about it intentionally, but they do. And you see it. And once you start to, to think this way, you can see it happening all around you. So I came up with an exercise. We'll see if this works. Never done this before. We'll see. But I want to try to help you see how this plays itself out. Because it's not like people walk around spouting their truths. Okay? Well, I believe. Blah, 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 blah. They just respond. They just react. They just live. And they're not even aware that these truths are driving them. So I want to help you with this. So I have three volunteers. Gentlemen, would you come forward? I'd like to introduce to you my three volunteers. And I'm going to assume a character now. My name is Cultural Norm. I'd like to introduce to you. Live for myself, Larry. There. You come right over here. All right. Don't judge me, Dave. And spiritual saint. All right.
Hi, I'm Larry. <laughs> hey, how's it going, Lift for myself, Larry? Norm, good to see you. Oh man, it's just been a crazy week. Hey, nice tie, by the way. Thank you. I like it myself. Even picked it up myself. I got a great story behind it. You want to hear it? Okay. <laughs> I'm going to tell you anyways. So, you know, Kohl's, they have the best return policy possible. You can really return anything you want. So I had a tie that I really wasn't wearing for about a year. Took it over there. Got myself a new tie. Just said it was a little frayed on the end. But again, the customer is always right at Kohl's. So I took it back, got a new one. Oh. What do you think? Oh. Well, how many times did you wear it? The old tie? Yeah. Once. That's why I wasn't wearing it anymore. Okay. Um, so, did you, it was used? Yeah. Okay, hey. Sounds it's good. cold. Yeah. You can return anything. <laughs> That's true. Um, yeah. I heard anything. That their motto is you're right even if you're wrong. That's right. <laughs> well, hey, it sure, it look, sure looks sharp, you know. I, Thank um, you. You know, speaking of going to stores, I went to the store the other day. I went to, I went to a grocery store. And I gave him some money, I bought my stuff, and oh man, I'm just sitting here, it's been bugging me all week. I went to the grocery store, and I, I, I gave him the money, and when they handed me the change back, they were supposed to give me a 20, but they must have stuck together or something, they gave me two 20s. And I saw it as I was walking out, but she had already given me a receipt, and I was walking out of the store, and I'm like, two 20s? And I just had this like battle within myself, should I turn around, should I not? And I just left, and then I just, ah, uh, I don't know, I don't know, what would you do? What would I do? <laughs> Norm, consider yourself having a payday. You have an opportunity to only live once around this rock. You got a little extra cash. You are living the American dream. All right, well, hey. All right, 20, 40 bucks. Woo! We should go grab a beer. All right, how about Tuesday? Uh, no, I'm returning something at Kohl's. So. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's pause here. I forgot to announce this. I'm going to put up their truths so you can see them. And I want you to listen to how they talk and how they respond. See if you can see why it would be, all right? So now we're going to go back to... Don't judge me, Dave. Hey, Dave, how are you? No, oh, I'm pretty good. How you doing? Oh, man, I've been great. Good, good, good. I've been hanging out. I haven't seen you very much lately. I haven't, I haven't seen you in church at all. What's what's going on? Yeah, you know, it's uh, it, it's it's totally cool. It's one of those things that... Uh... Oh, wait a minute. What? What's going on? Why haven't I been in church? <sighs> You know what? It's not a big deal. You know, we, we've had we've been busy. I understand that. Uh, you know, we had a Packer game that we had to get to last weekend, so we left early. Uh, but we had Bible study in the morning, so don't worry about it. You know, I'm with my family. You know, I went with them, spent time with them. Don't, not a big deal. Yeah, yeah. You know, they're gonna send you some postcards. From <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, we saw the first one, and then we got the phone call. But who cares? I mean, it's I'm spending time with my family. It's, it's not that big of a deal. Well, we pray at home. I'm just asking. I'm just asking because I can't Why? You. Why? I don't it's my life. I, well, that's true. It All right. True. You know what? The Lord says that you know, we should go receive his gifts. It's just a good place to be. Right? You know, I mean, I, it's not like I'm perfect. I haven't been there all the time either. Dude, God is love, man. He's, he knows my relationship with him. It's not that big of a deal. All I have one, all right? All right. Hey, hey, is that fine? I'm going to get beers. You want to come? Absolutely. Why not? Packer <laughs> game, right? Yeah. Oh wait, they're out of the playoffs. So. <laughs> Dang it! The <laughs> first out, Larry King. All right, he's going to return a tie. You and me. All right, sounds good. Sounds good. Thanks. Thanks, man. See it? Did you see it? Okay. Here we go. Hey Sam, how are you? Whoa, don't break my aura, man. I bet in a moment. <laughs> Sorry, man. Sorry, man. It's a spiritual awakening. 
Yeah, I, had a moment I, just, I don't want you to break it. I had a moment last week too, and I just turned on the fan. <laughs> Yeah, I you know, I, you're, pretty, you're a pretty spiritual person, you know, religious. And, I like to think I am. Yeah, for sure. And, I, you know, I, I just had a conversation that got me thinking. I, I've been, I've been, I just kind of got this sense of guilt on me. I, I, I know I'm supposed to, I know I'm supposed to be in worship, but I only make it about half the time. And I'm, I'm supposed to be there at church and the like. And so when I feel, sometimes I go and I feel like I, I just I feel guilty. You know, what, what do you, what do you think? You know, in the words of Vince Vaughn, I know my truth. <laughs> and you know your truth, man. You place it on your heart. All right? So if you don't make it all the time, what's it mean? I mean, the two of us are right here talking about it. You know, when two or more are gathered, he's right here. That, that's got to be good for at least two Sundays. <laughs> I know, right? That's some good stuff. It's yeah. true, it's in the book. Yeah, you know, but you know, they, they sent out those postcards I got one the other day, I felt guilty, and like, oh, and they say they care about me, and, and then, you know, the pastor, pastor, a guy was telling me how I should come, because the gifts are there, and like, the gifts? Yeah, like the sacrament for forgiveness of sins. I miss it on the gifts. Sins. Sacraments, forgiveness of sins. Sacraments, forgiveness of sins. Well, you know, you took those. I mean, you went to Christmas service, right? I mean, that's Easter Sunday. That's two right there. Yeah, two for yeah. sure. Two. Wait, how, how many time. times did Jesus take it? How many? Yeah. No, it's good, man. It's all good. He's He's in you. He loves you. It's, it's what matters, man. Oh, thanks. I feel much better. Hey, anytime, man. Anytime. Yeah. If you want to get together. Tuesday night. Yeah. 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 Time for that. Yeah. Time for that. Yeah. Larry won't be there. He's got time. I got one for him to return to, man. So right. I don't know his tricks, but all right, give it up for the. In the words of Vince Vaughn. I think it's... <laughs> That's a really good point. Well, really, the point of that was just to help you kind of see that everyone has truths that they hold, and the truths get kind of bandied around all the time, and they act as if they're not all that important, but they really do influence how we respond to real situations. And if I'm cultural norm, and I'm a Christian within the church, I'm running up against these all the time, and I have to learn how to deal with them, because the truth is every person has a book of truths. It's just in our culture, they're not very similar always. Those three, I thought, were pretty consistent with what I see happening all around me, even within the church, the things I hear uh, being told. And so the reason for doing this is to kind of point out that if we're going to start recognizing our culture for what it is and what we're not, that we are different, we should probably know what they are. And so here is kind of the three general truths of our culture, our society, things that for sure are just kind of there. Um, everyone kind of exists within these. And I would say... Of course, not faithful Christians, but everyone else. This is kind of just, this is for sure becoming the norm. One is truth is relative, right? You just see this. Truth is relative. You know, people can share different truths and things that they believe, and they can, they can share the different things that they believe, and uh, no big deal. Hey, whatever floats your boat, man. Right? Next thing is religion is universal. People don't get all worked up about the fact that someone's, you know, uh, I, I saw this when I, I think this was like 12 years ago, kind of ahead of the curve, but I was at, doing campus ministry at a, at a, a Christian, Christian school, Christian school, and um, they, they had Buddhist monks in their chapel doing a religious ceremony, and I, I just blew my mind. I couldn't imagine this happening, but when I talked to them, they're like, hey, you know, whatever, it's all just kind of, it's just good, it's just good. Spiritual Sam kind of helps us see this, and the last is this, that, and I, I saw this on lots of different places. This must be a motto out there on a poster or something. But share similarities, celebrate. In the workplace, you know, when they do these things about cultural awareness, this would be on one of their slides for sure. Share similarities, celebrate differences. We must practice what? Tolerance. It's one of the, the highest virtues of our culture, our society. 
But for a Christian now, the reason why we're going to continue to butt heads and pull is this. Truth belongs to, that's what we believe. And that is not the same as this. We will run headlong into this. All right? So the Lord teaches us to pray. Last week in that article that I sent out to you, the last one, the one that we're going to talk about here, is that God, that we are to be insulated from the culture in the world, but not of the world. And so we say to the culture, bring it. Right? We're here with you, but we're insulated from you. And you can say that, you know, we can provide, equip, whatever the words are. We'll use the words of that article, that we are insulated from it. Um, this is who we are and where we live. Now, uh, <clears throat> oh. where I came headlong into this as a pastor, a new pastor was in the baptism conversations we have in our congregation. And here's why, because we're a church that's all about discipleship in as many places as Right? So we're about discipleship. And so we want to talk with families about this. And so we meet with them. We talk about what baptism is. Because after all, the mission of the Christian church is to baptize and teach. And so this is our work. And so we're going to talk to these people. And so we do. And we come up within this that if we're going to be about this, that we need to be good at it. And you know, when you buy a house, you don't just... Like, go into the store and say, okay, I'm going to buy a house today. You think about it. You come up with a plan. How are we going to pay for it? How are we going to finance it? How are we going to furnish it? And you come up with these plans, the things you want and the things you don't. And you're very intentional in this step. When it comes to raising children in the Lord, how come it is that we don't really give much thought to it? We just kind of react. We spend our life reacting. And this, was all, this would all resonate with people of my age and younger. They were like, yeah, yeah, that's true, that's true. I, okay, i got to come up with a plan. And so I'd say, go home and come up with a plan. And they come back and talk to me. And we'll talk about your plan. And I noticed a pattern. This was the pattern. They would go home excited and ready and wanting to do this. And they'd come back and their plans would all look exactly the same. This is what they would look like. Sunday school, devotions, pray meals, pray before bed, go to church, confirmation. And a couple other things, maybe church can, whatever it might be. And I'd be like, oh, okay, okay, not quite what it, and that's not what I was necessarily looking for. And of course, all these things should happen, but I kind of just looked at these as given. This is what was already happening. So I would like, I would say, no, 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 let's talk a little deeper. How are you going to raise your kids in the Lord? And again, all of this stuff that we've been talking about, the culture clashes and post-Christian culture was all running through my head. And it hit me one day. They can only do what they know. And what do they know? What they've been taught. And what have they been taught? This is what Christians do. And this is what it was like when you lived with a culture, with a Judeo-Christian ethic that kind of walked alongside of you. You didn't have to teach, the, you didn't have to teach them that truth belongs to God because that was still kind of a presupposition of the culture, right? You didn't have to teach them the Ten Commandments and what they lived because they were in the where? Courthouse. You see this? And so I realized there was just a huge disconnect happening. And so what I did is I said I need to stop and I need to think about if I'm going to just throw out that they don't know what I'm talking about. Just start over. What are the basic things that a Christian believes that you would want to pass on to your children? And some of these should look incredibly familiar to you because we've been using them in worship and in preaching and our teaching all over the place. And, Jeff, could you stop them for just a second? I want to get through these three truths. Sing them some songs. You're the piano. <laughs> all right. This is the first one. It's all his. You guys heard this before? I would hope so. We say it in nausea all the time. It was amazing to me how many of people my age and younger had no idea and really did not ever think about this before. The second one is this. He saves. 
These sound incredibly simple, and they are. But this is where I had to start for the light bulb to start coming on. And the third is this. His will is best for us. So I tried this out, along with this story. And I'm going to tell it. I'm going to try to get it in three minutes. We'll see when this happens. I said, I want you to think about it this way. These are just truths. Everything in the world belongs to God. We live in his salvation and mercy and grace. And his will is what's best for us because he's God. So our will is not trustworthy because we're sinful. These are the things that just kind of got passing on. If your kids at 18, when they go off to college, have these three things in place, they will be in much better shape than they are today headed off to college. That was kind of my mindset. I keep up with this story. How many of you guys have ever seen this on a commercial or a picture, you know, kind of this idea that a little kid colors on the wall, right? So a little kid colors on the wall, and the parents are obviously. <laughs> and they're like this because when a little kid colors on the wall, it's not cute because what happens? You gotta shell out some money, you gotta paint, it's gonna be your time is gonna be printed away, you could have done something else, like go to a Packers game or return a tie, but for sure, <laughs> this is what you're gonna have to do. All of this is just a normal situation in life, and people would call this parenting. We as Christians would call this discipleship. Because you have an opportunity to teach all three of these truths to your little child hiding behind the couch. Why don't we draw on the wall? Whose wall is it? You're teaching them. The wall belongs to because it's all his. That's called sin when you do that, isn't it? But we belong to a God who saves, a God of salvation and mercy and grace. And so you teach them to repent. And then you do what? Forgive them. In the stead and by the command of who? And then you teach them that sin has consequences. His will is what's best for you. If you didn't write on the wall, you wouldn't be giving me all of your allowance to buy paint. <laughs> you see this? And I was like, and the light bulbs would come on. Oh, yeah, I could do that. And they would come up with all kinds of ideas. And the, the couples I've been working with, they still come up with ideas. They're way better at this than me. And it gave them something, some traction. I'm teaching the truths of God. I'm equipping my kids to live in this world. I'm insulating them. I'm like, this is great. I'm going to write a book. This is, it's going to be the best book. This is so creative. Oh, man. And one day as I was teaching this, it just hit me. That's not that creative. <laughs> really what was happening was I just maybe like should have read the catechism first or something. <laughs> because what I was teaching them was to live a creedal life. A life where God exists and his truths dictate who we are, not vice versa. And that's where we're going to spend our time in the next three weeks, going through each of these one at a time. And helping equip you, whether you're a parent, a grandparent, or just yourself, how do I live by these truths? Okay? All right. Go ahead and invite them in. We're going to, Pastor Jeff will end us. So while they're coming in, will you help me give thanks to God for this, what's going on? <laughs> we can start to see uh, why. We are so grateful you're here. These conversations have been going on for years and years. And they've been going on with very in small rooms with very limited number of people. But now we've got lots of people and we need more. And so we would encourage you to help us to continue to refine this conversation and your feedback helps with that send it to us also help us by getting the word out clearly we're going to run out of room somewhere along the line but we haven't run out of room we haven't put people on the stage we don't have us all so crunched in we can be inviting others and we need to be inviting others because at the end of this first five weeks, we're going to start a conversation that is going to start to get very, very specific. Like, why, you know, I, I was surprised Pastor Guy didn't put 
will we send our kids to a school? That's what it means to be a Christian. Well, I could tell you as someone who started a school, that's not a good reason to have a school. My wife and I started a school in California with lots of help with the congregation. In fact, before that, the church, the mission we started, started a, a preschool and daycare after we left. We need to talk about very specific things, like baptism conversations, like what does it mean to have these traditions like confirmation? What does it mean to prepare to have marriage and weddings? And what does all of this look like in West Bend, Wisconsin? Nowhere else. We'll let the rest of the church, and they are, coming to us to talk. And they're asking for our guidance, but we need to talk about it here. And we've got a good conversation started. Amen? It is great. And I thank God for you. And I would encourage you to, kids, when you go home, talk with moms and dads and talk about what they were afraid of when they were kids. Talk to them about that. Because you know what? Moms and dads grew up and they still are afraid of some things, guys. Pastor Jeff is still afraid of things. And it'll be good for you guys to talk through that. But for now, uh, we need some helpers to put chairs up on the, uh, uh, um, on the racks. And um, thank you for those that brought cookies. We want to continue to provide cookies and coffee. Please help us out with that. It'll be on the web page by It'll be on the web page by the end of the week. Keep Doug in your prayers. Doug is the guy who oversees this, and he um, is ill at home. Let's join in prayer. Let's join together in the family prayer. Lord, remember us in your kingdom, and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Have a great week.